Hey, Faith Community. I'm Jason Wick. We are continuing our walk through the New Testament together. Today we are in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, everything in this chapter is, is aimed at getting us to, to change aspects of our life so we could follow God, God a little bit more closely. And so it begins in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, the first couple of verses, uh, talk about us running the race uh, well, right? Running the race well. It says in verse 1, therefore, since we have since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so angrily, easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we are, are called uh, to, by God to, to lay aside every hindrance, right? everything that, that gets in the way of us following God more closely. We're to get rid of every sin. So there's things that distract us. If there's sins that we're uh, addicted to, if there's bad habits that we have that are keeping us away from God, like we need to, to, to free ourselves from those things. That's the sin that so easily ensnares us. And how do we do that? Right? We've, we've tried, we've seen the world try uh, to stop these, these bad behaviors, these, these sins. Uh, the world, what the world would say is maybe a bad habit, whether it's lying, whether it's swearing, whether it's uh, you know, lusting, whatever it is. How do, we, how do we stop these things? The world has, has their approaches. Right? I remember you know, seeing people with, with uh, rubber bands around their wrists, and every time they, they felt the urge to do something they knew they shouldn't do, they would you know, smack themselves with the rubber band. I've seen people with, with something like a swear jar, and every time they, they say a curse word, they put some money in the jar. Uh, these are, are band-aids for the problem, and the author of Hebrews gives us some real clear advice on what we are to do. It says, keep our eyes on Jesus, right? If we're focused on him, and, and who is he? He's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, right? He is is the core of, of our faith. He is the foundation upon which we we build our Christian life on. And so as we're thinking about Christ and everything that he's done for us, the sacrifice that he made, his death for 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 my sins, his his burial, his resurrection, proving that he had power over sin and death and Satan, and that he has allowed me to be adopted into his family, into the family of God, that I am now a co-heir with Christ. I don't have to walk in futility and purposelessness, but now I can walk with, with a richness of life, and I can enjoy life, and I have uh, everything I need for life and for godliness. I've been given great and precious promises. I have a future that is laid out. I have my path is ordained by God. All these wonderful things. As I focus on that and I keep my eyes on Christ, suddenly the things of this world don't look as appetizing. Right? They don't. They don't look as as good as they once did. I see through the facade. I th- see through the the fakeness and the the false hope that comes with these earthly pleasures. I see them for what they really are because I have my eyes focused on the true prize, and that is that is Jesus Christ Himself. The author then continues, and he wants us to understand the the purpose of discipline. All right, so he goes on in the next section to talk about discipline, and and there are times where we step off that path, we take our eyes off of Christ, where we're not focused on the things that we should be focused on, and discipline is is needed. And I had someone tell me once that that God knows exactly what discipline it takes to, to bring us back to him, and he's not afraid to go there. And so there's times where it's, we're wandering away from God and we're, we're going far off and doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing and, and, and God will discipline us to bring us back to him. And at the moment of discipline, think back to when you were a child. At the moment that discipline occurs, we don't like it, right? Why does it have to be this way? Why do I have to be punished? Why does it have to hurt? Why does this have to sting? But as we, we grow and mature and, and we look back at those moments where maybe our parents disciplined us, we can see that, oh, that was, that was correcting bad behavior. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for the discipline I was given because it kept me from, from going off the path even further. And even though it was painful in the moment, it had purpose and it brought me back to Christ. Verse 11 says, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time. Right? We don't like being disciplined by God at the time. It, it hurts, it stings, things have been taken away. You know, difficult conversations need to be had. There's repentance, there's tears, there's frustration. There's all of these things, but it's, it's painful. Later on, 
However, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And so we can look back and say, you know what? I do feel like a weight has been lifted. I do feel like a bur- the burden of sin is, is now gone. And now I can walk with the peaceful fruits of righteousness, right? This, this is the life that I was called to live. This is, this is who I'm meant to be. I'm so glad I'm not enslaved to that sin. And then through God's discipline, I've been brought back to the righteous path. And now I can enjoy the peace that comes with that. And then the, the author closes out the chapter uh, just wanting to make sure that we, in verse 14, we pursue peace with everyone. In verse 14, uh, later that we live, in, we live in holiness. Verse 15 talks about not letting bitterness spring up. Verse 16 says we're not supposed to be uh, immoral. Uh, then it talks about we're not also not supposed to be irrever- ir- irreverent like Esau was, right? Esau Going back to Genesis, Esau is the one uh, who who had the promises of God, had the birthright of of God, and and had this this amazing these amazing things of God laid out for him. Just, just this is waiting for you, Esau. As soon as as soon as the time is ready, you can take this. And what did Esau do? He traded it for earthly pre- pleasures. He traded it for for a bowl of soup from his brothers. And so, God is saying, look, don't don't have that attitude. Don't be like Esau. Don't just say no thanks to the things of God and yes to the things of the world. But instead, understand the glory of God is powerful. This is what verses 18 through 24 are talking about. The glory of God is powerful. It's it's awe-inspiring. Um, the author talks about, you know, this is it's, it's dangerous to go to the place of God because he's, he, he's so holy. Uh, he's so powerful. It's a terrifying experience to go to the place of God without a mediator, right? And so we have Christ. We have his blood that has cleansed us. We have forgiveness. We have been adopted into the family by God. So we can approach God now and let's do it with reverence, right? Let's do it with awe. Let's do it with understanding the character of God, the power, the might, the justice of God. And we can go boldly to his throne. Why? Not because of, of me, but because of Christ. And so we need to to surrender our lives to him. We need to run the race well, keeping our eyes focused on our Savior. We need to understand the purpose behind our discipline. Uh, and we need to understand that we have a God who deserves for us uh, to just be in awe over. And if we get those right, We'll see massive change in our life, and we'll see that that our lives can be used to praise and glorify him. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. I look forward to seeing you again. God bless.